This episode is brought to you by the Java Can, a ruggedized mobile coffee brewing system designed by a green beret so you can make a fresh cup of coffee anywhere life takes you. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. That's 10%. Go to thejavacan.com, use promo code AAR, and get 10% off your purchase. Live life charged. More people listen to podcasts than go to the movies on the weekends. So why doesn't your business have its own podcast? I'll tell you why. Because you don't know where to even start in the process. You don't want it to sound like you're recording in your mom's basement. And you simply don't have time to learn how to record, edit, and master the sound. Let ClearCommo take the stress out of podcasting and help you produce a high-quality podcast to share your company's message with its customers and future customers. If you're not in charge of your message, someone else is. So take charge today. Let us help you make a clear message with ClearCommo. Go to www.clearcommo.com and start your company's podcast today. Folks, the latest book on my must-read list is one that honestly might save your life. It's 365 Days of Survival by the folks at Captive Audience. This book has 365 days of tips and lessons of survival from people in the special operations world, law enforcement, and survivors. These tips span from wilderness to urban survival, natural disasters, and crisis planning. Be a force multiplier. 365 Days of Survival is available now on our website, theaarpodcast.com. Fortune favors the prepared folks, so don't wait to wish you knew what to do, know what to do with 365 Days of Survival. Go to theaarpodcast.com, scroll down, and order your copy of 365 Days of Survival today. When I started this podcast a little more than two years ago, I made a list of people that I really wanted to interview. Dan Alaric from Grunt Style, Matthew Griffin from Combat Flip Flops, and then there was my guest today. This is someone that I wasn't even sure I would ever actually get to talk to. Controversy can make people less inclined to talk, and there are few veterans as controversial as my guest today, Eric Prince. Now, he's the former CEO of Blackwater, a company that gained notoriety in the early 2000s for its role in the war in Iraq, which involved some very serious situations that remain contested to this day. Eric Prince has been at the center of these controversies, answering to Congress, investors, and the public alike. Love him, hate him, or you don't understand him, Eric Prince is one of the most well-known veteran business owners in the world. Now, before we get into this episode, I want to be clear about what this show is and what it is not. This is not a political show, and it is not a controversial show. I don't do gotcha journalism. I don't do journalism at all. This is a show about veteran entrepreneurship. We talk about business, what's gone right, wrong, and everything in between. That's it. I want to talk about transitioning from the military to do things that are more than a nine to five business, art, nonprofits, even political careers. But I don't care about changing your minds or swaying your opinions. I care about you, the listener, walking away with some new bit of advice or information that you can apply towards your own business or endeavor or whatever it is that you're working towards. That's it. So if you're expecting me to ask the hard questions to Eric Prince or to engage him on topics of politics or what you deem as controversial decisions he's made or whatever. This is not your interview and this is probably not your show. We talk about his experience in the world of business. He does bring up some things that honestly I was surprised at and it's still within the context of business and entrepreneurship. I enjoyed this conversation with Eric Prince. I wish I could have talked with him for a whole lot more about his experience as a business person and not just maybe as a business person but as a person 
I walked away from this episode with a sense that Eric Prince is a guy with a message. He's a guy with a vision. He sees the world through a lens very few people may understand. Or maybe it's a lens very few people are willing to allow themselves to see through. So clear your mental palate. Come into this interview with an open mind. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Prince. Eric, thanks for being on the show. For the five people who don't know who you are, tell us, who is Eric Prince? <laughs> well, I am, uh, I am extremely proud to have been a SEAL. I am very proud to have started Blackwater and to have provided a great service to my country at a time of need. And it was also extremely satisfying to be able to employ thousands and thousands of veterans, of experienced people who had already volunteered to serve their country once and were going back, volunteering again as a contractor to help their country again. And it is still extremely satisfying for me. I was just at the SHOT Show a couple of weeks ago, and I had... Uh, Dozens of guys come through and say, thanks for the opportunity. It was the best job they had. And so we, you know, at Blackwater, uh, look, I started the business. I never set out to be a defense contractor at all. Um, I had planned to stay a SEAL much longer, but my father died and my uh, wife then got cancer. And so things changed at home. I needed to go try to sort things out. <clears throat> and I, st I started Blackwater as a way to stay connected to the SEAL teams. And, you know, I certainly claim no pride of, uh, of origin or no, no, I claim no originality in the idea. I think a lot of soft guys had the idea that a training facility was necessary, one that was industrial in scope and size, but that uh, I was in an unusual position at a time of the peace dividend and of government drawdown, and they were literally closing a major range or training area across America on a, every week, on average. So the idea of a business plan for a private firearms and tactics training facility, most, most thought was kind of dumb. But again, um, as many veterans do, they might see a niche from their military experience that they could provide a better service than what the government has access to now. And that's all we did. And we tried to provide a, a country club kind of experience, okay, in the sense that, you know, when you show up to a, to a country club, you expect your green tea, the, the tea time to be right, you expect the grass to be cut, and it's a service you're expecting. And the same way a staff unit, an infantry unit, somebody that is going into harm's way is expecting, um, you know, you want to maximize the training, minimize the BS. And so that's what we, um, that's what we set out to do. And, uh, you know, my father's business was in the automotive space, made a lot of car parts in a hyper efficient, hyper competitive industry. And so we tried to apply some of that skill set to the defense contracting space, Blackwater grew to do the recruiting, vetting, equipping, training, deploying, and supporting the specialty people to go do a difficult job in a difficult place. And because we were vertically integrated, we minimized the inefficiencies of what the government or even what many of my other competitors had to face. And so we just basically, we basically provided a venue for really skilled people maximize their experience, to maximize the use of their experience, and to apply it uh, across the board. Now, I will say, uh, you know, I, was just, I got out of the SEAL teams as an 03, as a lieutenant. And what we also found is the danger of staying in the military 25, 30, or 35 years, that people that are staying that long in the DOD really only think one way and they have trouble adapting to a 
market-based, efficient, and very competitive business. We had a bias towards wow. NCOs and staff offices, and that worked pretty well. We, we never hired anybody over 05, as a matter of fact. Was that a policy, or is that just from what you saw, the behavior? Uh, the behavior and the ability to adapt to an entrepreneurial, fast-moving, adaptive company. And I'm not saying now, that is, there's is that rep- 06s and 08s and 010s that can't do that. I'm just saying I haven't seen one that has. Is that inflexibility you're talking about, does that does that also apply to individuals from the soft community, or, or are we talking about primarily like the uh, traditional conventional guys? Look, whether it was aviators or, you know, across the board, we, we were a complete polyglot of veterans, to include law enforcement as well. My one bit of advice for the veteran that is getting out or thinking about getting out is one of the great deficiencies that people that serve in the military have is they don't understand finance. And in the military, the money comes from Congress, it gets distributed, and it gets filtered down to the Pentagon. It's a very different world um, when you're in business where you have to seek investors and then you have to, once you have a business, you have to seek customers that you convince to pay you, right? And you might have a great idea that's looking for a problem to solve. You need, you need to solve a problem that someone's willing to pay you to solve. And it's a, there's a fundamental difference there. And so I would encourage anybody in their last six months or year of service to maximize the amount of financial literacy they can get their hands on basic accounting, basic finance, um, so that you you start to be able to stand in both worlds. It's interesting. A lot of uh, people that I've talked to, especially vets that are getting out, one of the things I, I heard a lot, especially uh, about six years ago when I was getting out, was I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of the Army. I'm going to get out of the military. I'm going to go pick up a contract job overseas. I'm going to bank super money. And then I'm going to go either start my business or I'm going to go and do another thing. Has the world of contracting, especially the world of, of you know, the civilian warrior, how has that evolved since the days of, of Blackwater? Well, I'm out of that uh, since 210. But what I will tell you, because I still keep, uh, you know, pretty close tabs in the industry, is that, you know, the standards of the, the people doing the kind of jobs that Blackwater did the standards have kind of uh, diminished or changed at least. And so the pay, the daily rates uh, have fallen significantly. The taxation regime, right? I understand the guys have to pay Afghan or Iraqi taxes and the companies have not innovated in a way to help the guys shelter their money. Um, so look, we at Blackwater did not have a problem recruiting because we went out of our way to take care of the guys make sure they got paid on time, that they had extra insurance uh, and all that. And so, sadly, a lot of the work today has become highly commoditized. And, uh, and so the, the wage pressure for the people that are looking to do it has certainly gone uh, significant. It's almost um, 50% of what it was 8 and 10 years ago. And that's true. I mean, I've seen that myself, and I and I know a lot of guys that have gone out there to do this type of work. I was a contractor myself for a hot bit, and you know, we we I I got out of that game, especially for those reasons you just stated. You know, it's just it seems to be changing. The world is changing, Mister Prince. The world is definitely changing. But let me let me and let me make uh, let me give you let me give you one exception to that. Would be um, please uh, someone that will go on the field and perform high end medical care. Because whether you're an energy company, a mining company, a construction company, there is always need for for that kind of high-end care. And those and those daily rates seem to have unchanged or even gone up. What would you consider some of the traits of a of a of an entrepreneur? You know, you've been in that game, you've been in that space for a long bit now. What are some of the traits of, of a successful entrepreneur that you feel? Um, could could be things can be adapted by a veteran coming out. Look, you have a you got to be tenacious. You have to be 
uh, you have to love it so much that you think about it 24 hours a day. And, you know, it's, you're starting a business like that. It's hard to keep a life balance. Um, but a, um, you know, businesses go through phases and when it's in an infant phase, it requires an enormous amount of maintenance, just like an infant does. And then when it gets to be, uh, you know, a toddler and a teenager, those things change as well. So it's, um, it is tough. And the other thing I would, I would say is if, as you're taking outside investment, very careful of whose money you take because that person becomes your partner. They get to vote. And depending on what business you're in, you might have very different ideas uh, as to how things are done. And, uh, you know, I had, I, had, I had the unique luxury of being able to fund Blackwater because of my father's success. And I, I will acknowledge that gave me a huge tailwind. Um, but it probably probably also was an advantage to the business that uh, we had a very short decision chain and allowed the company to take risks and to say yes to missions that government needed us to do quicker than anybody else. And we put real capital at risk. I mean, nobody else showed up to Iraq and Afghanistan with 73 of their own aircraft, some of which were shot down in combat. As you're thinking about your business, or what business you want to start, there's basically three buckets you should be able to put, one of three buckets you should put the business in. One is operational efficiency, operational excellence, right? That's the Walmart model where you can so, you can become so efficient, you drive out every bit of waste and you become the low cost provider for some kind of service, okay? Or you become the product innovator where the next thing you come up with is so great and so unique that the customers just got to have it. Or the third one is customer intimacy. What you, you become so indispensable to your customer, you become so embedded like a tick that it's very tough for them to ever get rid of you. So, you know, the, uh, the concept number two, the, the new product, whether you're an Apple or whether you're, uh, you, you make the next consumer or government product that everybody just has to have. An example of the third one would be somebody like um, UPS, which handles all the returns and warranty and maintenance work for a lot of IT companies, where when you send a computer back, it doesn't go back to the computer maker. It goes to a UPS facility where some guy fixes your device. Uh, right outside of St. Louis, and then it gets sent back to you. That is a very difficult and painful thing for that computer maker to move away from. The other thing you have to be careful of is that government is a really dumb buyer. And as rational as you hope and think they are, U.S. government is a really stupid buyer of goods and services. And, and so expect, if, you're, if you think the sales cycle should be three months, plan for a year plus. And this is not a new phenomenon. It's just the nature of bureaucracy. If you think about William Gatling, okay, you've heard of the Gatling guy. The, the, the U.S. <laughs> government, despite its best intentions, can be a very dumb buyer of goods and services. And it goes back, it's historic. William Gatling developed the Gatling gun based on a corn planter. And he developed this in early 1860, 61, 62. Now, if you know history, America was involved in the Civil War then. He took this great idea to the chief of U.S. Army Ordnance. And what was that genius's response? He said, why would I want a gun that consumes so much ammunition? And he rejected it and rejected it and rejected it. But Gatling persisted, and he eventually convinced Lincoln to do a live fire demo on the National Mall in front of the White House. And that's finally what got the Army to buy the Gatling gun which had a significant effect towards the end of the war. Or the Wright brothers, okay? They developed the first aircraft, and they took it to the Army. And what did the Army say? What? Why would we need an aircraft? We have aerostats and balloons. So they sold it to the French. So, again, don't expect, however, you're, when you're doing your, your spend plan and you're doing investment, plan for a drought for a long time because the government is a very, very dumb buyer. 
and it's your job as the entrepreneur to get on as many contract vehicles or the GSA schedule or whatever, make it easy for the government to pay for what you offer. We'll discount that. But it's ultimately, it's a contract officer that signs that purchase order, signs that contract, and will send you money, not the general, not some officer, it's a contract officer. Important distinction. So one of the things we talk about on the show, uh, it is an after action review. So one of the things we always want to hit on is a lesson learned. Uh, in your long career, what is a lesson that you've learned that you'd like to impart on our listeners? Be careful who your customers are. Okay. We had no issues. We did long and significant work for the DOD or uh, the various parts of the intelligence community, for law enforcement, for DHS, all the above. It was solely the work for the State Department that ruined the company. And I regret ever lifting a finger to help them in any way, shape, or form. They were just not worth it. Hmm. So be careful of who your customers are, because that, cause that, can, that can take you down along with them, right? Is that what I'm understanding? Absolutely. 100%. Look, I mean, here's the thing. No, the State Department, uh, they have a mission, but it is, again, such a large bureaucracy that the – I'll give you an example of the craziness. So we're working for the State Department. We're providing diplomatic security. They're demanding more and more teams of people operating from their embassies overseas. Another part of the State Department who's supposed to be licensing the export of things like helmets and body armor used by those American citizens working for the other part of their building – State Department. State Department's not keeping up. So one side is beating on us for contract noncompliance because they don't have helmets and body armor. And the licensing folks are just aren't keeping up, right? Because you have two wars going on and they just haven't done it. And so when the politics change a few years later, it uh, they come back to fry you for it. And there's really no due process in that uh, in that entire thing. So again, be very careful who your customers are. Get everything in writing, lock them down with emails, a, a word or a, a verbal statement from somebody, not enough. Cover your ass because the government bureaucrats will always hang you out to dry. So when we talk about what would we do differently, obviously not doing business with the State Department would be something you would most likely not do again if you, you, know, if you were in that position again. But – Looking back on it, what could you have done differently had you continued to do business with the State Department? Well, you know, the, uh, the tragedy of the Nisera Square event, I believe, would have been averted if we had asserted ourselves. You know, we'd asked for them, we'd asked them for cameras five months previously. We want to put cameras in all the vehicles, on the guys, just like a cruiser cam in a police, in a police car, to prevent the, the uh, confusion of battle. And we had, you know, we had other vehicles that we were running doing movements to and from um, Baghdad Airport and other places like that. And uh, those cameras worked a number of times to avert the confusion uh, that there was a wrongful shooting. And so when we went to the State Department and asked for cameras for all the vehicles, their lawyers said no, because if it actually films something bad, it'll make the State Department look bad. And uh, in reality is, uh, protect your people and protect your company. Uh, and then remember that the bureaucrats were hanging out to dry. So again, uh, if we had been, um, you know, I, I guess hindsight, we should have uh, basically gone on strike to say no cameras, no work, because uh, you will uh, you can see in the future. Yeah, certainly know that it was the uh, became the demise of the company. Now. The world is changing. The world is quickly evolving. We've got, you know, ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Afghanistan is still a thing. Uh, I believe we're pulling troops from Syria now. Where are we headed, Eric? In, in your opinion, where are we headed as a world? And does the civilian warrior, does the contractor still have a place in this future? Well, the civilian warrior was uh, came to America before any British troops did. It's, you know, it was... Remember, the, the Jamestown, Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth colonies were 
companies listed on the London Stock Exchange. They hired people like John Smith and Miles Standish, private military contractors, civilian warriors, if you would, uh, to, came, to come and protect their colonies. So the profession is as old, uh, you know, it's as old as, as warfare and sadly as old as conflict. But um, there absolutely is a role going forward. I think the U.S. military has demonstrated in Afghanistan that they've mastered the most expensive way to wage war and not very effectively. And, and despite the hundreds of billions of dollars, the trillions of dollars, actually, by the time you include all the healthcare, legacy health care costs, all that technology, all those sensors and surveillance and force protection, get all the rest, and we're still being defeated by a largely illiterate enemy using basic weaponry and Toyota pickup trucks. And so that is certainly unsustainable. I think the president has the right instincts to pull troops back out of, F- out of Syria. There are contracted ways that the allies there, the Kurds, the, uh, the Free Syrian, sorry, the um, Syrian Democratic uh, Alliance can be protected from the Iranians and Syrians. I hope they explore those options. Um, and the same way in Afghanistan, the president, I understand, has ordered to draw down a 7,000 troops starting in April already. And I believe the Afghans will quickly come to realize that the skeletal support structure I've been recommending for the last year and a half, he's almost two years now, uh, is the only way to keep the lights on and to keep, uh, look, I think it's very, very bad. Um, I was six years old, 1975, when uh, the helicopters off the CIA safe house in Hanoi, sorry, in um, Saigon, were on TV, when Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese. It was an extremely bad day for America. And were the Afghan security forces to collapse, as even the president of Afghanistan has predicted they would if uh, U.S. support was withdrawn, the image of the Taliban taking Kabul and U.S. helicopters lifting people off the roof of the U.S. embassy would be extremely bad for all of civilization because it would empower every jihadi around the world to thump their chest and say, yeah, we beat those guys. We cannot let that happen. Uh, it is extremely bad for our, our safety and security, and it dishonors every vet who gave uh, their life or their limb or their time serving there. You've got to make sure this thing ends well and not in disaster. Eric, what are you doing next? What What is next for Eric Prince? Well, right now I'm raising a, uh, a strategic mineral fund with the premise that uh, as more and more cars become electric, uh, it will create a huge bottleneck on the supply of a few strategic minerals from copper and up in the value chain to include cobalt and nickel and vanadium. And uh, we're raising a fund to go uh, find and prove and um, and build mines to uh, to produce those uh, those commodities needed by uh, U.S. and uh, and global automakers, and and even to include uh, you know whether you're doing solar or wind, right? You have to transport that electricity from the point of generation to the point of use, and that means an enormous additional quantity of copper high gauge wire to move that. So that's uh, that's what I'm spending most of my time on now. And just to uh, and just to dissuade any confusion, there's again some uh, media gets it wrong this week about building uh, some training facility in Xinjiang province for the Chinese, and that is uh, absolutely not the case. The the, the board actually discussed it uh, the past couple of meetings and and rejected that notion. So anyway, not doing that. Okay. Uh, I am focused on uh, strategic minerals. You just hit on something really uh, that. You know, very rarely does somebody like yourself have an opportunity to just say what it is that's on your mind, dispel a rumor. Is there something that you've heard that you're like, this is absolutely not true? This has been going on for some time. Is there some a record you want to set straight? <laughs> well, put it this way. I think I've sadly become clickbait. And so people uh, ascribe all kinds of craziness to, uh, to whatever it is they imagine I'm doing. So uh, you probably don't have enough tape to uh, dispel all the clickbait rumors out there. but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right. If we want to learn more about Eric Prince, how do we do that? I've uh, I've certainly made uh, I, I have a YouTube channel called Wars of Waste, 
and I explain what the U.S. should do in Afghanistan to support the Afghan security forces in a much cheaper way, and uh, even translate it into Dari, if you're a Dari speaker. Um, and uh, just in the last uh, few months, uh, we relaunched Blackwater Ammunition. Uh, I sold the business back in 2010, but I still own the brand. And so Blackwater uh, Ammunition now makes uh, very high-end ammunition from 9 mil up through 50 cal. We have some very uh, unique technology. Our 50 cal ammo weighs one-third less than um, any other ammo that's been made using the same bullet, same powder, but our case weighs significantly less and is made with much higher precision. Uh, we have some new rounds being developed, uh, available second half of the year, and some very good firearms as well. So that's, uh, I guess that's all the news for now. Terrific. And do you have any um, websites or anything you want to plug other than the YouTube channel? Are you on Twitter? Are you on social media? No, not at all. Not a big user or, or, or consumer of social media. Hey, that's all right, sir. That's all right. Hey, I want to thank you again for taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to talk with me, talk with the people here at uh, the After Action Review. Uh, you are something of uh, a hero to many and a uh, a bit of an anomaly to others. I think it's you're, you're a character in a very interesting drama that has unfolded over the last 20 years. Look, the last – I'll give one last comment that when you build a business, enjoy the ride, pick people that you like to work with because you're going to spend a lot of time with them. And, you know, when I started Blackwater. I went back to the well that, you know, I mean, I, the, the two, my two training officers from SEAL team joined. A lot of other SEALs joined, a lot of guys from the soft community, and, and we built from there. But go to the community that you know and trust and, uh, and build from there. And, uh, and make sure you have really good finance uh, knowledge in the organization as well. Folks, that was Eric Prince. Tell me what you thought about this interview by leaving me a comment on iTunes, LinkedIn, Facebook, or at our website, theaarpodcast.com. Leave a five-star review if you think we earned it. I think we did. Don't forget to buy from veteran businesses. Our sponsors, of course, are the Java Can. 365 days of survival available on Amazon. And your business is looking to start a podcast? It should be. Well, then you need to go to clearcomo.com. That's C-L-E-A-R-C-O-M-M-O.com. Find out how easy it is to start a high-quality commercial podcast at clearcomo.com. That does it for me, folks. I will see you at the next episode.